My name is Jeff Resnick. I'm chief of the History of Medicine Division at the National Library of Medicine at the National Institutes of Health. Thank you very much for joining us today as we continue our 2022 series of all virtual NLM history talks with the sixth annual NLM Michael E. DeBakey Lecture in the History of Medicine. And to those of you who are following on, on Twitter, thank you for following us uh, using the hashtag NLM Hist Talk. NLM History Talks promote awareness and use of NLM and related historical collections for research, education, and public service in biomedicine, the social sciences, and the humanities. The series also supports the commitment of the National Library of Medicine in two very important ways. First, the commitment to recognizing the diversity of its collections, which span 10 centuries, encompass a range of digital and physical formats, and originate from nearly every part of the globe. The series also reflects the commitment of the library to foreground voices of people of color, women, and individuals of a variety of cultural and disciplinary backgrounds who value our collections and use them to advance their research, their teaching, and their learning. We supplement NLM History Talks with speaker interviews on our blog called Circulating Now, located at circulatingnow.nlm.nih.gov. I'll add that NLM History Talks are made possible by an outstanding team here at the National Library of Medicine and at NIH Video Casting, and I want to thank each and every one of my colleagues there for their time and their talent in bringing this program to you, the public. Today's program, like all of our talks, is being live streamed globally and will be archived by NIH Video Casting for free access by anyone, anywhere. This access is made possible by a generous gift to the NLM by the Michael E. DeBakey Medical Foundation, and it's that gift which, in 2016, helped our institution to establish the NLM Michael E. DeBakey Fellowship in the History of Medicine. The fellowship provides up to $10,000 to support research in the historical collections of the NLM, which include the papers of Dr. Michael E. DeBakey, reflecting the diverse areas in which he made a lasting impact as a legendary American surgeon, educator, and medical statesman, ranging from the fields of surgery to medical education, to healthcare policy, and much more. Later this month, we will be launching the 2023 cycle of the NLM DeBakey Fellowship Program, and please look for that announcement off the main NLM homepage. The gift of the uh, DeBakey Medical Foundation also makes possible this portion of the NLM History of Medicine, uh, NLM History Talks. This is the annual Michael E. DeBakey Lecture in History of Medicine, offered by a selected fellow based on her or his completed research in the historical collections of the NLM. And this year, it's my pleasure and privilege to welcome Dr. Matthew Stibbe, Professor of Modern European History at Sheffield Hallam University in the UK and 2019 NLM Michael E. DeBakey Fellow. A specialist in 20th century German and European history, Dr. Stibbe attended the universities of Bristol and Sussex and spent a year as an exchange student at the Humboldt University in Berlin. His first full-time lecturing post was at the University of Wales in Bangor, and he also worked for four and a half years at Liverpool Hope University before joining Sheffield Hallam in 2003. He became a reader at Sheffield Hallam in 2007 and a professor in 2010. Dr. Stibbe is associate editor of the international journal Immigrants and Minorities with particular responsibility for its special issues. He is also author and co-author of more than three dozen articles and book chapters in English and in German with pieces in journals such as the German Historical Institute London Bulletin, Studies in National Movements, Women's History Review, Journal of Contemporary History, and Immigrants and Minorities, among many other uh, journals. He is also author of five books and co-editor of many more, notably with Kevin McDermott, the volume Eastern Europe in 1968, Responses to the Prague Spring and Warsaw Pact Invasion, and with Ingrid Sharp, entitled Women Activists Between War and Peace, Europe, 1918 to 1923. One of Dr. Stibbe's own and most recent books, Civilian Internment During the First World War, A European and Global History, 1914-1920, was published by Palgrave Macmillan in 2019 and completed in part through his DeBakey Fellowship at the National Library of Medicine. His presentation today highlights aspects of his research while offering us a glimpse of his future work on emergency regimes in Germany and elsewhere since 1914. Dr. Stibbe, thank you very much for joining us today. We look forward to your talk entitled The Laboratory of Humanitarianism, Military and Civilian Captivity During the First World War. Welcome and thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, Jeff, for that very generous um, introduction. 
Um, before I present the overarching themes of the of my presentation for today, I'd like to begin uh, well begin by thanking um, Jeff and thanking the Mikey, Michael DeBakey Fellowship um, and the, the Medical Foundation for funding uh, first of all my fellowship in 2019 and now my annual lecture um, three years later. I'm very grateful um, uh, uh, to, to the National Library of Medicine and to the uh, DeBakey Medical um, Foundation. Um, I'd like to begin by discussing the image that you can see on the opening slide of a group of captives in the First World War. And what you can see um, there is a group of captives, but none of them fit the conventional picture of a military prisoner of war. Without wishing to offend the men in the picture, they are clearly civilians, dressed as civilians, and are clearly, in most cases, beyond the age, beyond the normal military age at that time of 18 to 45. And we can also see that in the picture there are women prisoners of war as well. The people in this photograph are um, Habsburg subject Italian speakers. So um, uh, um, Italian speakers from the border region of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, who in 1915 were deported from their homes on the frontier between Austria, Hungary and Italy on suspicion of being pro-Italian and sent to a prisoner of war camp in the Austrian interior called Katzenau. And so a picture like this, we also see an overlap, not only between the military and the civilian, but we also see um, an overlap between um, the notion of wartime captivity and the notion of criminalization. This is a almost like a police photograph. The, um, uh, the prisoners have been given numbers by the Austro-Hungarian military, um, uh, and they are they are they are classified as as criminal suspects, although they have not been uh, put on trial or given any access to lawyers. Now, this um, picture is one of many examples of the diversity of First World War um, captivity. And when I was writing the book that Jeff kindly referred to, that was published. In 20, at the end of 2019, about six months after I've been in, in the, at the National Library of Medicine. When I was writing it, I was still struggling um, with how to create or find a more holistic approach to wartime captivity that really captured the, um, the human condition of being held as a prisoner of war at a particular moment in time, i.e. the First World War. What was it like as a human experience? And how do we bring all its many dimensions together? In particular, I wanted to get away from what I felt was an unhelpful dichotomy in most statist approaches to captivity, which merely posed the question, was this rational policy or not? Was it rational of the Habsburg state, as an example, to deport so many Italian speaking subjects into the interior? Was there a real danger of pro-Italian sentiment in these areas? Or was it irrational? Um, was it based on, um, uh, 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 on, on fears that were not real? Now, I felt that this dichotomy doesn't help us to, it doesn't really help us to get a, a full uh, picture of what um, uh, captivity was as a global phenomenon um, during the First World War. I wanted to move beyond the question of is it rational or irrational to look at how captivity in particular contexts, particular situations impacted on our understanding of what it meant to be human. And that's why the my, my fellowship um, uh, uh, three years ago at the National Library of Medicine was so useful to me. The collections that it had there, particularly on the mental health aspects of captivity and the kind of dilemmas that knowledge or growing knowledge of the mental health impact of long-term captivity had, this, um, this, 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 um, this knowledge was there for me to find in the many publications and leaflets at the National Library of Medicine. But I also want to particularly mention the contribution that Michael DeBakey has made to creating this library and making it what it is, and opening it up to world um, scholars. I'm lucky enough to have been one of the, I think to date, two dozen fellows of uh, Michael De uh, DeBakey Fellows at the National Library of Medicine. What I want to note is that I understand that after, his, after the Second World War, 
and his work in what was originally the um, army um, medical library, um, he came to the conclusion that the original army medical library um, had had uh, 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 was had overlapping military and civilian dimensions. That it wasn't just about war, and it wasn't just about um, persons serving in the military, but they had overlapping military and civilian dim dimensions, purposes, and functions. And that is why he campaigned to have it uh, transformed from the um, Army Medical Library into the National Library of Medicine and to be relocated to where it is today in Bethesda, um, Maryland. And to take on this uh, holistic approach of combining biomedicine with social sciences and humanities um, approaches. My argument today, or my overarching argument in, in my paper today, is, is that um, captivity itself had overlapping military and civilian dimensions, purposes, features, and that we cannot understand it holistically without understanding this overlapping of the military and civilian. So that's the beginning of my that's the um, end of my beginning of the beginning of my lecture. I'm now going to move on to my first slide. I want to think about the dimensions, firstly, of captivity during the First World War and the different different types of captivity. Conventionally, historians have focused on uh, uh, the captives um, who were serving in the belligerent armies. Um, we can say today that around about eight to nine million serving military personnel went into wartime captivity and that uh, the death rate was 11 percent, which is about the same uh, death rate as, as amongst, among non-captured soldiers as well but it varied a lot the death rate varied a lot um, from country to country from camp to camp and a lot of the conditions um, the variation in conditions in prison of war camps particularly in Europe were determined um, at basic level by the attitude of the com camp commandant. We also know um, from the work of Heather Jones um, published about 10 years ago that in many countries there's a dual system of captivity. Um, we tended to focus before Heather Jones on home front camps, camps where soldiers were sent to, um, after being captured on the battlefield, sent back into the captor nation's territory. But in fact, Heather Jones shows that one of the key innovations of First World War captivity was the largely illegal use of labor battalions, mobile labor battalions of POWs who were forced to work immediately behind the front lines or in what's called the army staging areas in Europe on the western, eastern, southern, southeastern fronts. Um, and um, they, they had much harsher um, uh, uh, conditions and no access to Red Cross visits or um, medical inspections um, beyond the um, uh, beyond those given by the captain nation. So Heather Jones was very crucial in, in, in drawing our attention to um, the hidden dual aspect of wartime captivity and the more unfortunate military prisoners of war who were used um, to um, build fortifications, men trenches, um, etc. in the in, in the war zones uh, just behind the front lines. In addition, we have civilian captivity enemy aliens, meaning nationals of the um, opposing state who are on enemy territory when the war broke out, and civilians deported as hostages or forced labor or suspected um, terrorists deported from occupied territory. At least 400,000 um, enemy alien civilian captives in um, First World War Europe, at least 100,000 um, in the rest of the world, uh, enemy alien captives in all, con all continents of the world, and they perform a forgotten but important dimension of the captive experience. Third category, military internment. Um, some soldiers were interned in neutral countries for two reasons. Firstly, countries like Switzerland and the Netherlands were obliged under the terms of their own neutrality to intern soldiers who strayed into their territory, belligerent soldiers who strayed into their territory. If they didn't, they were not seen as not protecting their own neutrality and giving justification 
for belligerent states to interfere into intervene on onto their territory so um uh, neutrality is an active thing it, it can't just be passive it has to neutrality has to be protected but in addition in the second half of the first world war the swiss followed by the dutch uh, the swiss at a bigger level and the dutch at a, at a smaller level numerically agreed to take in um, very um, to, uh, uh, sick and wounded prisoners of war from in belligerent captivity in order to um, uh, give them a, a lighter form of captivity and to heal them back from sick sickness so this is what this is a military internment by international agreement and it meant particularly the swiss also to some extent the dutch were very heavily involved in captivity directly in holding prisoners of war captive and to some extent benefiting from medical knowledge that they got from lo looking at certain illnesses and certain battlefield injuries and treating them particularly for the swiss hotel industry there was an economic uh, gain to be had as well the swiss hotels and sanatoria were suffering economically uh, from far fewer tourists coming uh, to visit them in the first world war and this was a solution uh, to open the hotels and sanatoria to um, selected groups of prisoners of war who was held to have treatable um, uh, illnesses. That's what, what I would call military internment. The last two um, in this um, on this slide are persons who were interned by their own governments. So we have during wartime political suspects. Um, detained by their own governments. The Italians you saw in the first picture are it, Austrian subjects who, who their own government has, det has detained them outside of courts in a non-judicial sense because they are politically suspect. Um, welfare detention, um, workhouses and other um, uh, um, institutions functioned during the First World War in most European countries, and there's a lot more poverty and destitution, particularly among foreigners living in those countries. And workhouses were used as a form of, I've put here, welfare detention, but um, uh, all kinds of uh, persons who were labelled work shy or pet, petty criminal um, uh, um, or prostitutes were put into so called welfare detention. And then finally, what today we were called internally displaced persons, refugees from war zones who, who escaped into their own country, escaped um, backwards into their own country, but were held in refugee camps, which were often barbed wire guarded uh, to prevent them from mixing with local populations, to avoid tensions, to avoid um, fears about a spread of diseases and also um, the, in, in Central Europe in particular, the, 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 um, the food shortages meant there was a lot of tension between internally displaced persons and indigenous persons in the interior of Germany or Austria, Hungary. So we've got, a, we've got a, 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 we have to see captivity itself in holistic terms. It's not simply about um, the, 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 the typical military personnel captured on the battlefield. There are all kinds of different captives, all kinds of different medical um, and other implications from First World War captivity. And I should also factor in time. One of the, um, as well as the extent of the sheer number of people being held captive was unprecedented. So too is the amount of time that some people were held, three, four, even years, even longer, which again raised medical and social issues as well. What about protections for prisoners of war? What prevented um, captain nations from um, treating them very, very, very badly or uh, even murderously? Um, military POWs were protected in theory by international legislation. I haven't got time to go through all the details of the Geneva and Hague Conventions, except to say the bottom line was that captured states were supposed to treat captured soldiers from the opposite side according to the same standards as their own enlisted men in terms of food, accommodation, access to medical care and so forth. Whether they did or not is a different story. Um, but they were protected in theory under these international conventions, Geneva Conventions and the Hague Conventions on Land Warfare. But this was restricted to military POWs only. Secondly, and more importantly, prisoners of war were protected by the reciprocity principle. In other words, captain nations would not mistreat prisoners because they wanted to protect the interests of their own 
subjects in enemy captivity, where numbers of prisoners were roughly equal, for instance, between Britain and Germany with regard to military prisoners, then you, one could um, uh, uh, imagine that there would be re reciprocity would prevent um, uh, significant amounts of mal uh, treatment. Re re reciprocity in some situations could also protect civilian prisoners of war. They could be included in that. And they could also be included in um, the uh, work done by protecting powers, neutral countries um, who visited camps and looked after the interests of um, POWs on behalf of um, belligerent countries during the war. And they often employed their own medical and nutritional experts. America, the United States, was the protecting power for um, Britain in Germany and Germany in Britain until it entered the war in 1917, and also for the Hungarian half of the, um, uh, um, uh, for, for Britain and France in the Hungarian half of the Habsburg Empire. Other protecting powers, Spain, Switzerland, Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, um, played their role as protecting powers as well. The International Committee of the Red Cross, based in Geneva, Switzerland, campaigned both, it didn't have any legal powers, but it campaigned um, to, if, for want of a better word, to shame belligerent countries into obeying the Geneva and Hague Conventions. And it also uh, campaigned for better treatments for civilian captives, among other things, to draw attention to the plight of civilian captives, and in some circumstances to uh, 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 campaign to have them treated equally um, as well as military prisoners. Military internees in Switzerland and the Netherlands um, who were, were protected by bilateral agreements between different belligerent countries. So agreements between Britain and Germany, uh, France and Germany, Austria and Italy and other, uh, uh, other combinations meant that the military internees were sent to neutral internment, uh, were guaranteed particular um, rights and protections. But the important thing um, to remember is uh, no in international protections for persons interned by their own government. They have none of this. So the Italians that you saw at the beginning of my lecture do not have any protections whatsoever. There's no protecting power. The International Committee of the Red Cross does not interfere in what governments do to their own subjects really at this time. Um, there's no, re 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 the reciprocity principle does not work in their favour and they have no protections under Geneva or Hague Convention. So there is quite a stark inequality there in terms of what protections um, uh, prisoners have and what protections they don't have. Um, my first book was about a camp for British civilians in Germany, a camp at Ruhleben near Berlin, 1914 to 18. And the Ruhleben prisoners, although I wouldn't pretend that um, being captive for four years is comfortable, enjoyed relatively good conditions because Britain and its empire held about 10 times as many Germans in, in, in Britain itself, on the Isle of Man and in various British colonies. And this encouraged the Germans to look after the British prisoners who were not required to do um, forced labour. And the, the site of the camp near Berlin meant it was very easily reached by the American embassy officials and after 1917 by Dutch um, uh, embassy officials and it had it had certain advantages I'm not I'm not certainly not suggesting that captivity in any circumstance was comfortable but this was one of the relatively better camps because of its situation and because of the nationality of the prisoners inside um, inside it there are a lot worse camps in Germany um, there are even worse camps in other countries Austria Hungary and um, elsewhere. Um, the value of captives, now this is worth thinking about, that for captive states, POWs were not just a liability in resource terms, but a potential asset as well. And this is where the um, framers of the Geneva Convention and the Hague Convention they hadn't considered this. They set down certain obligations about, about um, needing to feed prisoners of war, and clothe and house them to the same standard as enlisted troops in, in, in your own army. But um, they didn't actually take on board that what might happen in a lengthy world conflict is that captives and the treatment of captives is partly predicated on them being seen as assets rather than, simple, uh, rather, rather than simply as liabilities by captive powers. Sometimes captive powers refer to POWs as so-called useless eaters, I'll put that in inverted commas, so you do hear that quite a lot, but that has, that's 
not just a, um, a one-sided affair. It means that certain prisoners could be seen as useful eaters. So you had to feed them, but they had their uses at the same time. They could be valuable in exchange agreements or even peace negotiations as bargaining counters. They could be a source of intelligence. And by that, I don't mean battlefield intelligence particularly, but the being allowed to censor the mail of POWs could give it armies um, and National Red Crosses quite a lot of insight into, um, into the mentality of, of, of soldiers on both sides of the war. The Austro-Hungarian army put a lot of resources into filtering out intelligence from the letters sent by their own subjects in enemy captivity. They were very worried about, towards the end of the war, about how many Habsburg subjects in Russian captivity were subscribing to Bolshevik or left-wing views, for instance. They would actually gauge morale uh, um, among their troops by, by what was said by POWs, their own POWs, um, in their correspondence back home. Thirdly, we've seen in the case of the use of mobile POW labour battalions in occupied territory in the staging areas, a source of labour. Now, the central powers regularly complained that Britain and France, as the war continued, had all the advantages of being able to bring their colonial subjects from Africa and Asia, plus large numbers of civilian Chinese labourers to France to work on trench fortifications. And Germany and Austria-Hungary said, because we're cut off from the world, we don't have that advantage. We are forced to use POW labour in this fashion, even though it contravenes um, parts of the Hague Convention, which say that POWs cannot be forced to work in, in directly in the field of military operations. Um, POWs had a propaganda role. They're a big part of the propaganda war. If you want to present yourself as a captain nation as belonging to the civilized world and your enemies belonging to the, to the, the barbaric world, um, talking about spreading propaganda about conditions in captivity is very useful. Often stories about captivity were used to re-mobilize enthusiasm for the war at different stages in 1916, 1917 and so forth. Governments, particularly um, democratic governments, wanted to re-mobilise enthusiasm for the war by persuading families at home that they were doing their best to look after subjects in enemy captivity. And that was a mark of their civilization or their civilised standards and a mark of their response, you know, their, their um, response to public demand, demand of families. So advertising relief parcels and relief efforts that were being undertaken by national governments had um, a, a military and civilian purpose in terms of remobilizing enthusiasm for the war. And there's a very good article in the, in the journal Immigrants and Minorities by, by uh, um, uh, an author Nadia Durbach called, the title is The Parcel is Political. It's about British relief efforts, but the, the, the relief parcel became a big political propaganda tool how much goes into it? What kind of comforts are our prisoners being given? How, um, how do our parcels compare to the parcels of other nations where the, Brit the British want to present themselves as having the best parcels for um, looking after their, ca uh, their captives um, uh, um, in the best way possible? So there are a, lot, a number of, of, of ways in which um, captives can be an asset in a long war. And the legal um, frameworks had not taken that into account. They take into account the fact that, that um, prisoners might be abused because they're liabilities, but they hadn't taken, the legal framework had not considered that prisoners might be abused because they, they could be assets in different ways. And they hadn't thought through how that might uh, mean that there's an overlap between um, uh, 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 captivity and um, humanitarianism and politics. So what, where, do we where do we see the spaces that can open up for um, a treatment of uh, um, uh, relief for um, persons in captivity? First of all, the, the first one was a laboratory. The Red Cross campaigned very strongly for um, uh, um, captain nations to um, treat civilian captives at least as well as they treated military captives. But there's a dilemma there because 
if they were treated as military captives, civilians could actually experience disadvantages as well as advantages. They might not be able to excuse themselves so easily from labor, for instance. And with civilian captives had their own particular um, needs that went beyond the military needs. Almost all military captives wanted to go home, wanted to be repatriated. But some civilian captives didn't actually want to go home, particularly if they're enemy aliens who were living before the war in the country that had interned them. They might not want to go back to, the, to, the, to their home of origin, their country of origin. So there are all kinds of dilemmas around whether um, treating civilian captives as, as, as well as military prisoners might actually disadvantage them in some ways as well as um, uh, uh, promising them better conditions in other ways. Reprisals of good. Now, negative reprisals were used all the time by captive powers to enforce better treatment of their own captives. So um, uh, um, uh, uh, forbidding um, prisoners um, the right to parole walks if the other side did that as well, uh, um, shortening rations and so forth. Those, I suppose, we could call reprisals of bad. But certain groups, particularly the Quakers in Britain, um, uh, pioneered this idea that if, if we organise good things for German captives in Britain, then maybe we will encourage the other side to do the same. The Quakers encouraged um, universities in Britain to send scientific equipment to German scientists who were prisoners of war in civilian or military contexts in Britain, so they could carry on with their scientific experiments. Um, um, I'm afraid I still don't quite know what a spectroscope is, but a very apparently a very expensive piece of equipment was sent by the Quakers and the University of Leeds into a camp at Wakefield in Yorkshire in Britain. In return, the um, Kaiser Wilhelm Institute um, in Berlin sent similar equipment into British scientists being held in Ruhleben, where the camp that I wrote about. Um, many of the Hans Geiger was the head of physics at the uh, one of the key physics professors in um, in Berlin at this time, and he had many British PhD students who ended up being interned because he worked with um, Professor, Rutherf the, Professor Rutherford and Hans Geiger had an uh, academic partnership before the war, which meant exchanging their students. Um, uh, but this is a reprisal of good. It meant that their students, um, one, one of whom in, in Germany was James Chadwick, who went on to win a Nobel Prize for physics in 1931. He was given the equipment and books um, by Hans Geiger and various other famous scientists. Uh, Albert Einstein was also involved in this um, to, to be able to continue their studies, their education whilst in uh, captivity. In various ways, the professionalization of relief efforts went hand in hand with the professionalization of national security measures. So just as sensors and security experts become more professionalized, so does relief work, reports on nutrition, statistics on nutrition, hospitalizations, medical care are all put into Red Cross reports and into government reports about the state of prisoners, um, um, physical condition of prisoners in different national and local contexts. There could be experimentation with release schemes for different categories of prisoner, whether on medical grounds or on reaching a certain age, so the um, uh, over 45s, they could be sent into inter neutral internment, as I've said, or sometimes into so-called confinement where they could live outside a camp but had to report to the police station once a week. Catholic groups and rather differently and for different reasons, feminist groups in Spain, Switzerland, the Netherlands became concerned with the often hidden suffering of the dependence of long-term captives, women and children whose husbands, fathers, sons were in long-term captivity. Um, and we've, we see a lot of campaigning groups, I'm gonna mention one in particular in a minute, um, who develop an awareness that captivity isn't just about those who are held captive, but as the war continues about the dependence of those held captive. In fact, to um, give you an example, when I was writing uh, um, my book um, a long time ago now about the Ruhleben camp for British civilians held in Berlin, one of the most shocking anecdotes I heard was that, well, quite a f um, several hundred of the prisoners, British prisoners at Ruhleben had uh, wives and children living in Berlin. Um, German born wives and Berlin born children who were nonetheless legally British because of their marriage, because of their father's nationality. They were allowed to visit their um, fathers in Ruhleben twice a month. 
And when they did so, particularly in the second half of the war, they smuggled food out of the camp because the prisoners had better food through Red Cross relief parcels than did Berliners under the impact of the Allied economic blockade. So that sort of turns our idea of prison camps up, uh, upside down, doesn't it? We, we, we associate prison camps with lack of food, but actually um, the prisoners, if they were in a good situation, in a well-situated camp and protected by reciprocity, um, could actually enjoy better health and better food conditions than their wives and children on the um, outside, particularly, as I said, in the second half um, of the war. But all these opportunities, all these spaces for experimentation are equally, um, they are problematic because they're subject to political manipulation. Um, they're subject, if we take a holistic approach to them, states themselves have got a political interest in displaying humanitarian credentials in um, aligning treatment of civilian captives with military captives. Often they can get involved in humanitarianism. Often humanitarian organizations have to allow them to get involved in order to get anywhere, in order to achieve certain goals. But it does mean that their um, state, the danger that statist approaches can enter into uh, understandings of humanitarianism and that humanitarianism itself can begin to that the, the internationalization of humanitarianism can can, can 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 end up in a situation where it's it, where it's also in part and inadvertently feeding the radicalization of war propaganda of violent imagery um, uh, produced um, during the war as well. Um, so, what can we say about relief activities? Well, as the war continued, relief schemes became increasingly nationalized. Um, states took over release, um, uh, relief packages and um, decided to standardize them. We've, um, uh, instead of allowing private charities and groups to send what might seem random parcels to random groups of people, the state interferes, in Britain particularly, the Red Cross Society interferes and says, all donations to, for relief parcels come through us. And we create a standard relief parcel that contains this. Uh, we've had nutritional experts and medical experts look into this. And um, we, uh, uh, this is the ideal um, uh, uh, for us, that we, the, the ideal amount of food, the ideal amount of books, the ideal amount of sports equipment, and so forth. I mean, that's a nationalization of relief efforts. The International Committee of the Red Cross was the key, um, was one of the big clearing houses for relief. It sent, um, according to its post-war report, it was sending um, 300, sorry, 30,000 um, items of mail per day were going through Geneva from one belligerent country to another. 30,000 a day, um, 20 million in total through the war. But equally, the Danish Red Cross in Copenhagen and, the, and another organization run by the, the King of Spain, a, a much more Catholic and royalist enterprise run from the royal palaces in Spain, neutral Spain was the European War Office. Um, a colleague of mine, Marina Perez de Arcos, has been writing um, about this until recently, very little known, a parallel um, organization to the Red Cross with very different ethos, Catholic and royal rather than internationalist and medical um, uh, um, that was being run in Spain. Um, so these clearing houses um, helped to, to, um, uh, um, to, to spread relief. Um, but we also get the danger that with standardization of relief parcels and relief processes, we're ignoring the needs of particular groups. Um, a lot of relief organizations decided um, uh, by default mainly that um, the typical prisoner or the norm, the norm for a prisoner was white, a white male literate person um, aged between 18 and 45. Um, and that didn't fit the remit of all captives, uh, certainly on gender grounds and on race grounds and on age grounds, it didn't fit um, um, all the people um, uh, affected by captivity. So that there's a certain blindness towards the needs of particular groups can creep, can creep in as relief becomes more nationalized and internationalized. Elizabeth Rotten, I'm keeping my eye on the time here, but Elizabeth Rotten is somebody I've been very interested in, a Swiss national 
um, who spent some of the pre-war years in Cambridge, England, and then just before the war moved to Berlin. And although I, I think, strictly speaking, she wasn't a Quaker, she was very close, to, she developed close ties with the English and American Quakers whilst in Berlin, and wanted to set up a shadow organization in Germany, well, sorry, a mirror organization would be a better term, uh, to, the, to the Friends Society in um, Britain, which sought to help Germans, Austrians, and Hungarians in distress. She, want, she created an organization that sought to help foreigners enemy aliens in Germany who were in distress. And she took the line that those who were most distressed were not the people who were in camps, who were already being looked after by the, the British, by the American Embassy, by the, Red, by the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, but, um, but the, the wives and children. Um, and her organization um, spent a lot of time and effort uh, um, looking after the wives and children of Ruleben prisoners in particular, based in, uh, uh, based in Berlin. These um, women and children were legally British, although often didn't speak English and had never been to Britain. If they wanted help from the British state, they had to agree to travel to Britain in the middle of the war um, uh, and leave their husbands in, in captivity in Berlin, because under the trading of the Enemy um, Act, Britain would not send them any relief directly to Germany. Um, you could only get relief if you're in a prison camp via the Red Cross parcels. Um, they, although they might be German born because they were legally British, they had no claim on German charities and they were um, uh, in a very dire situation. Elizabeth Rotten and her organisation helped a um, huge number of, 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 of these mixed nationality families, particularly British German families, but other nationalities as well. She visited Belgium, occupied Belgium as a Swiss national and persuaded the, uh, governor gen the German governor general to release 200 French children who had been stranded in Belgium when the war began on their summer holidays in August 1914. They'd spent two years in sort of stranded in Belgium, but they were allowed to return home to their families in unoccupied France through her intervention. Elizabeth Rotten was a feminist. She attended the Hague conference, um, uh, anti-war conference, a feminist conference, um, at Congress of Women, I think it's called in, uh, in The Hague in 1915 on her Swiss passport. Um, she also was involved in a group, in, uh, an anti-war group in Berlin called the Bund Neues Vaterland. And some of her, the officials who, some of the German officials who worked for her organization were arrested uh, by the Berlin police and placed in protective custody on grounds of having illicit contacts with foreigners and being anti-war. But Elizabeth Rotten herself managed to stay out of custody, partly because she had connections in high places. She's a pacifist and a, pa a feminist, um, deeply opposed to the war, but she also uh, nurtured contacts both within German big business, who supplied the funding that kept um, that provided the food and rent money for families she was supporting in Berlin. So big banking names like Warburg um, and um, uh, uh, and others uh, bankrolled her organisation, German business, and she also had contacts in the Prussian Ministry of War, which may explain why she wasn't arrested um, uh, um, as the subversive or deported to Switzerland. But again, this demonstrates that that humanitarianism had to involve itself in politics and use the advantages that the Prussian Ministry of War saw in um, funding an organisation like hers or in allowing it to run um, in terms of protecting the interests of Germans abroad, um, in terms of protecting Germany's image as a civilised country. And when the camp that I have been talking about, Ruleben, dissolved in November 1918, when the war came to an end, um, the, the Prussian Ministry of War asked Elizabeth Rotten to be the negotiator between them and the British authorities with regard to repatriation arrangements. This is in spite of the fact that she'd been dubbed in some quarters as a subversive um, uh, who, who should be arrested or, or, or deported. So her organisation was very important in drawing attention to the needs of a particular group, um, women, um, uh, non-interned women whose husbands were um, uh, in wartime internment. Um, and I should also say Elizabeth Rotten was an academic. She was a, um, she'd been in Cambridge and she'd also studied at, at Marbach University and she's 
um, very much of the neo-Kantian school, and I'm not going to talk a lot about neo-Kantianism, but very much the philosophy behind her organisation is that um, human beings should be ends in themselves, not simply means. And although her organisation used statistics, she was much more keen to present the life, real life stories of the people that she represented, rather than simply talking about nutri nutritional statistics, medical statistics, um, and so forth. Um, and we can see this, if I go back to this point about the standardization of relief and the, the blind spots that it could create. This is an example of the Red Cross in Geneva kept these files on military and pris civilian prisoners. It relied on captain agents to provide them with accurate information, that didn't always happen. But this is what their file system looked like. And this is what an in two index files look like um, from the Red, Red Cross in Geneva. These are the files they created on prisoners. So they're very bureaucratic and depersonalized. And at least inadvertently, they assume that prisoners are um, white male, military aged men, literate men um, from white European armies or civilians. The one on your, your, your right is my own grandfather who was interned at, at Ruleben camp. And you can see there, it's got his name and where he was born. And his, um, he wasn't a lawyer, that's a mistake, um, but he was a businessman, but the, the, the rest of the information on that is accurate. On the left, you can see another prisoner at Ruleben, a man called David Russell, who was born um, in Jamaica in 1874 and was living in Leipzig near Chemnitz. And his, this card index was created in Geneva at the same, on the same day. Um, and they're both in Ruleben. Um, but just to show you that, that what counted was nationality. And what we don't see um, is um, that David Russell was a black British subject. I know that through other means, but simply by looking at his Red Cross file, we do not know. We would not know that he was um, a black British subject. And black, uh, a Jamaican who'd never been to Britain Who'd come, who was a sailor, um, had sailed from Jamaica to firstly to Austria and then settled in Leipzig in Saxony. And he had particular needs um, owing to his um, uh, background heritage um, in Jamaica that would be ignored by the, um, by the Red Cross or not seen by the Red Cross. So again, um, several hundred black and Asian prisoners of war in Central Europe during the First World War. The European War Office in Madrid, which I didn't know about very much until um, my colleague um, uh, Marina Perez de Arcas um, has begun writing about this organization based in the Royal Palace in Madrid and sponsored by the King of Spain. Um, it's, it was a, not only a POW um, uh, bureau, but also a bureau to search for missing persons. And what's interesting about that archive is that whereas in the Red Cross archive, all you can see is these, which have been digitized, you can look them up, it's a brilliant database. In the, in the Royal Palace archives, which I've not yet been to, but I'm, uh, COVID etc. has prevented me, but I'm really looking forward to being able to go there. They have the much more personalized information, you get a photograph of the prisoner, and often the letters from their relatives looking for them, looking for missing persons, as well as the details about this. This is an able seaman. Um, Marina sent me this um, a photograph to use in this um, presentation, but here, interestingly, we get a much less bureaucratic uh, approach um, to um, uh, relief, but this is a smaller and perhaps we might say, um, this is a very value laden thing to say, but perhaps less professionalized and slick, um, but more personalized way of looking after the interests of prisoners and trying to keep um, uh, 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 links together with their families at home. So Catholic and royalist enterprise as opposed to the internationalist and more medicalized process uh, um, that was organized by the, the Red Cross. Um, I'm conscious of time, but, but um, before I come to my conclusion, um, the one thing I did want to talk about as well is exchange agreements. So um, bilateral agreements were created for exchanging prisoners, either on grounds of, of having reached a certain age or on medical grounds. Um, uh, and particularly in the first part of the war, what in French was called the grand blessé, the very seriously wounded persons who were, there's no, who would not recover and would not be able to fight again, 
uh, were, um, it was agreed that they could be exchanged. The Vatican was involved in the exchange process, but Switzerland and the Netherlands had to be the, had to, put, had to allow their territory to be used to evacuate British and German prisoners exchanged them via Dutch territory, or in the case of German and French soldiers via Swiss territory. We've, I've talked about neutral internment, which is a form of exchange, and that was not for the very seriously ill did, but uh, wounded, but what was called malade um, French, which means people with conditions that could be treated in Swiss sanatoria and Swiss hospitals by Swiss army medics. Um, and these people would have to remain in neutral internments until the end of the war, but they would get the medical treatment that they needed in order to recover from whatever conditions they had had on the, from the battlefield or from um, captivity. In 1917, an Anglo-German uh, an Anglo-German exchange agreement was the first time that barbed wire disease was recognised as a condition internationally that could could be grounds for exchange. Well, what does barbed wire disease mean? It's a umbrella term for mental health conditions observed by um, in long-term captive, captives, lethargy, depression. Um, uh, um, uh, boredom, uh, um, uh, um, long, essentially long-term depression. Um, that was the collective term used, barbed wire disease, to describe this, and it was a term that actually came into this agreement, mental health conditions. In September 1917, the Austro-Hungarians were so concerned that they even offered to exchange all prisoners who'd been in, in uh, captivity for more than two years. Two years is long enough, they, they said. Nobody should be held from in wartime captivity for more than two years, perhaps partly because of the mental health impact. Although um, the uh, information that I have is that the main concern of the Austro-Hungarians was how they're going to feed prisoners in the last two years of the war. This was made at a, a conference between the Central Powers and Kerensky's Russia in Copenhagen a few weeks before the Bolshevik Revolution. So it came to nothing. The Bolsheviks um, uh, weren't interested. Um, uh, um, in, in continuing what Kerensky had started, uh, or Kerensky's representatives had started. But it's interesting, nonetheless, that there's a beginning notion that the sheer time, time could be a factor in creating, in, in making captivity inhumane. Well, however good the conditions might be, there's only a certain amount of time that it would be legitimate to hold somebody without expecting them to suffer from serious mental health conditions. Um, in particular, there's some problems with bringing in mental health. I, found, I learned a lot about this at the, during my fellowship at the National Library of Medicine. Um, firstly, there's a real concern. If you're going to exchange some prisoners, the ones that don't get on the exchange list, are it's gonna have a, it has a huge impact on their mental health. Why, do they, why, aren't they, why can't they go home when others can? So um, uh, there's a lot of camps are full of rumours about who is and who isn't on an exchange list. You have to convince the medical commission and so forth. Some medical experts in Switzerland were very sceptical about whether neutral internment in Switzerland would actually have any health benefits. Charles Julliard, French, Swiss, um, Swiss French um, medic, professor of medicine um, in Geneva, was very skeptical. He felt that it just encouraged shirkers to try and get into neutral internment and then from neutral internment to get repatriation. He felt that um, whether consciously or subconsciously, um, um, this was encouraging um, uh, poor habits, that um, he even invented a, a, an alternative phrase to barbed wire disease. His view was something called la captivitus in French. Whatever this means, it means, it, it, it effectively in English, plain English means shirking. Those who um, um, who uh, um, are obsessed with the idea of being released and getting home and therefore simulate symptoms of physical or mental ill health. And he, uh, Julia, as with a lot of medics, used to work before the war for workers' accident insurance companies. And he was obsessed with people who simulated conditions to get money or get get advantages. Um, and he felt that the medical profession was being abused or misused in this way. And that, that was, he felt that barbed wire disease, if it did exist, was a was an abnormal condition, um, uh, was a deviance. Um, however, 
His views were, were opposed by another Swiss medic called Adolf Lucas Fischer, who I was very interested in. I knew a little bit about Fischer before I came to Bethesda, but I learned a lot more whilst I was there. I was able to contextualize much more about his book on barbed wire disease, um, which was a very political book. And the more I think about it, the more I understand it to be a very political book. Um, um, Barbed wire disease then, this is Fischer and his book, which was, which was published first in German in Switzerland and then in English, but no French version. The French authorities did not believe that barbed wire disease was a condition. Fischer, Fischer was a medic. He worked for the Swiss um, army and then for the Swiss um, embassy in London and inspected camps on behalf of the Swiss and um, uh, um, inspected camps in Switzerland and in Britain on behalf of the Swiss authorities. Um, his view, it was, became a very political view. His pamphlet here, Barbed Wire Disease, Contributions to the Psychology of Captivity, was not very medical and did not present any hard medical facts and um, was largely um, uh, a um, uh, disowned by the medical profession, or at least crit heavily criticised. Barbed wire disease as a phrase did not take off like shell shock did, and nor do we find it much in the Second World War. Um, it was not seen as a scientifically um, uh, um, clear-cut pamphlet or scientifically well-grounded As a piece of, um, and what and what and what it was about in the First World War, as a, as a holistic approach, he said, and this is controversial politically in international humanitarian circles, it, he said it doesn't matter how good the conditions are in a camp, after a certain period of time, everybody in the, the, the in a prison of war camp will develop mental health symptoms not just those who develop very obvious ones that necessitate their removal to a psychiatric institution, but at a lower level, every prisoner. He also said something that I only really began to understand during COVID, and that is what he said is, we don't know what long-term captivity will do, just like we don't know what long-term lockdowns will do. We've got a vague idea that it's going to have a mental health impact, but we the, the scariest thing about it is we don't know what it will take to recover from barbed wire disease and whether it will be permanent or not and what this will do to society, to masculinity, to productivity. In short, he got into trouble with the Quakers and others because they felt that relief and sending books and equipment and distractions to prisoners of war was a good thing. Whereas he said the only thing, the only humane thing to do is to release captives. Nobody can stand cap war captivity for more than six months, he said. Afterwards, they have to be released. It's inhumane to keep them in, in captivity. And the Quakers and others who seek to mitigate their, um, their, um, uh, um, their conditions are delusional. And he was quite, quite open about, uh, about, about suggesting that. So this is a very big political message to give, that captivity in itself is inhumane. However humane, even the Swiss hotels and sanatoria, he says, um, the best medical conditions that could be on offer were not good enough to stave off barbed wire disease. So I've come to the um, the end of my talk. I'm sorry, I'm over and too much. Um, my conclusions, I stress the hybrid nature of First World War captivity. It belongs both to the civilian and military experience of war. That's what's, what makes it so fascinating. Um, um, just like the Bakey found the, the work of the Army Library of Medicine so fascinating for the same reason. It belongs to the history of belligerence, so we can talk about captainations, but also to neutrality. Neutral countries were captainations. It belongs to the history of the radicalization of violence and also to the internationalization of humanitarian efforts. The two things go together. In order to understand it um, more clearly, we need to look beyond the view, this sort of statist view that says captivity is either about rational military ends or irrational violence, um, one of those two poles. Instead, I think we need to look at it much more holistically in, in terms of particular situations, 
um, particular contexts. And this requires more empirical work, including into the medical historical aspects of captivity. And there is no better place to start looking for this empirical work than in the National Library of Medicine. Thank you very much. Dr. Stibbe, thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, thank you very much and for all your time to prepare it and to be with us this afternoon or in the evening as it is where you are. Uh, we have a, a several questions that have come in. Um, one of them pertains to your comments on uh, barbed wire disease and Fisher's book. Uh, this person writes, thank you for this very fascinating talk and certainly for your research into this subject. You talked about finding interesting material about mental health in wartime captives uh, during World War I. Uh, this was the same period, of course, when shell shock was recognized as a mental health condition among combat soldiers, spurring many novel, treat uh, novel treatment regimens. Did the increased focus on mental health in the military population influence the medical response to mental health risks among civilians in captivity? As far as I know, no. I've, I, they, the two things seem to go in as parallel lines that never touch. I've not found any evidence of references to shell shock in um, literature um, or even camp magazines. Um, um, in, in 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 um, uh, 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 prison camps, but vice versa um, in in any of the literature on shell shock about um, uh, barbed wire disease, the two things seem to be kept very strongly apart. And I think that part, that, I think that reflects in part the idea that um, uh, shell shell shock is seen as something that could be cured and prisoners be sent back to the battlefield, whereas captives are in a Seen as seen at least by the top brass military as being in a separate universe, um, who you know eventually they'll be repatriated, but they're out out of the war. Barbed wire disease itself, um, Fisher didn't invent that phrase. It's a colloquial phrase that we find in in um, camp magazines. The prisoners themselves um, used that term. But what Fisher pointed out was that he found that both the British and uh, German. Uh, soldiers were using that phrase barbed wire disease to describe their mental health sy symptoms so it's a transnational it's, it crosses it crosses boundaries um the french um uh, for reasons that i began to understand when i was in bethesda um uh, rejected that term they preferred um cafar which means which is using the french foreign legion which is a kind of homesickness um that you might experience in the in the french foreign legion but they, they wouldn't allow the idea that captivity itself uh, could cause mental health symptoms. So the French military were, were, were refusing to recognise it full stop, whereas the Swiss, um, the Swiss army medics were very interested in it as a concept. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you say, another question to come in, can you say more about the relationship between and among humanitarian aid agencies? You described their different approaches and perspectives but was there competition among and between them on the international front? And if there was competition, on what basis? Yes, um, um, certainly there's, there's more cooperation than competition. It would be unfair to say that competition dominated. And certainly we see where we get Swiss um, activists involved, like Elizabeth Rotten, who are very keen to bring the German, uh, the, the British Quakers together with German relief organizations and with feminist groups in Switzerland, we do see a lot of, um, of crossover, but um, I don't think that, um, I think there are areas where the cooperation could have benefited, there could have been greater cooperation, or barriers to cooperation rather than, rather than deliberate non-cooperation, if that makes sense. I think one of the biggest barriers was that in Calvinist Geneva, um, uh, with its humanitarian stroke medicalized ideas around the Red Cross, there's, very there's a great deal of barriers to cooperation with the vatican and with this with the royal the spanish royal, royal family um uh, organization the european war office and that's partly historical and partly ideological i don't think there was a sort of deliberate um hostility in competition but barriers cultural barriers to um the kind of things that both would get involved um get involved with um and you know, we, we, we do see um, my, my colleague Marina Perez de Arcos has done some research on the Spanish side and found some co some um, correspondence 
between the Red Cross in Geneva and the, the Spanish Royal Palace, but but not much. They had a very different ethos um, uh, to them, um, and um, that that created certainly created barriers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So a related question is. Uh, some humanitarian agencies focused on prisoners more than others, uh, and many of them focused on civilian and military needs more broadly during the war. Did any of the agencies acknowledge being spread too thin, or to what extent did their coverage drive their contribution campaigns? Yes, I mean, both really. Yes, finances were very, very important, particularly for, for non-government organisations. So Elizabeth Rotten had to um, really had to network very strongly with German bankers. And she went for people like Max Wahlberg, who famous Hamburg um, banking family who eventually came to Britain in the Nazi period, the Wahlberg family. Um, uh, um, but um, uh, because of their connections with London, their trade with London, if you want to bit reconnect your trade interests after the war, then this is the most important way to do it. Often, um, some of the some of the big companies had employees in in internment camps, um, and that could be used as a way of. of uh, so the spread had to be re the the bigger the spread, the more, uh, particularly as. as national relief efforts became more and more centralized. They had to work with them rather than um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, in, in isolation from them. And that meant that meant you know, coverage coverage was linked to political compromises and to um, uh, to negotiations with the powers that be. Yeah, very much so. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, this one is, is related to the concept of the generation of 1914, which may not be a familiar one to some folks who are listening. So uh, the generation of 1914 is, describes the cohort uh, of individuals who experienced the war at the front. Uh, it's a historiographical term. So this person writes, are prisoners of war in all of their diversity considered to be part of the generation of 1914 or do they stand apart from this in some other category? Um, they stand apart in many cases. It's a very good question, a very interesting question. Um, I think that um, in most, certainly in the British and German army, officers who were captured when they were repatriated were obliged to give an account of, you know, to be interrogated as to how they got into captivity. With the, with the assumption that they did something wrong or that they've got, they've got to demonstrate that they hadn't had any other choice but to give themselves up to captivity. Certainly all the academic literature on um, hero, heroization of, of the generation of 1914 um, states that the real heroes were the ones who fell on the battlefield and that um, POWs, military POWs, are, are very low on what um, Iris Rakanamov, historian, calls the commemorative pecking order. They, they're down near the bottom somewhere. Um, civilian captives, even more so, men of military age who didn't fight. So I'll give you, this is an anecdote, which will help to explain that um, a little bit. In Ruleben, where the British um, prisoners were kept, in the first winter was quite bad. Um, but when it got to spring, the first sunny day, the German military um, released all the um, deck chairs. It was, Ruleben was a race track before the war. They had lots of deck chairs. In so they released them all and had the prisoners sit out on the race course in the sun. And they had the German Berlin newspapers come and take photographs of them. And somehow this got back to Britain and was published in the Daily Mail, which is a very, quite a anti-foreigner newspaper. And they, the Daily Mail was not very sympathetic to the Ruleben prisoners because they assumed that they are mostly German or suspect Britishers. Why would they want to live in Germany if they were truly British? Uh, so they're sitting in deck chairs in 1915 when men of their own age are fighting on the Western Front. And they are very, very, very upset by this picture. You know, it made them look like they were sitting out the war. You know, it was like a holiday camp. Uh, it was a piece of propaganda that was intended to make the Germans look generous, but in the British, it made the prisoners look very um, uh, lazy and, and not. You know, and they feel they've got to um, uh, um, either keep quiet about their suffering. So barbed wire disease is another reason why it's not talked about after the war is it's, it's not seen as a real war um, um, wound. Uh, a heroic wound or something heroic you can talk about. Um, um, 
or they've got to find some way of paralyzing their story by talking about escapes and things like that. But it, it, it doesn't, it, it's, it's an uphill struggle to get recognition. I think um, on one of my slides I was saying in France, the French developed a medal for uh, POWs who escaped, but not for POWs who didn't. Um, uh, and that tells you something. Final point about this, and that's interesting, is that um, POWs um, uh, ha in Germany and Austria had their own separate veterans organizations because they weren't welcomed in the 20s into the regular military um, ones. But in 1933, Hitler met a delegation of um, from the POW Association, as if he's welcoming POWs into the Volksgemeinschaft, the, the, the new national community. And as long as they're not Jewish or outside the national community, they become part of the war myth. So hit, this is part of, this is a very big piece of propaganda. Suddenly it's not just the fallen heroes, but Hitler's creating a new, and I read the other day, it's very interesting to me that the same thing happened in Austria in 1933. Now, this is before Hitler, before the Anschluss in 1938, but Austria also entered a period of right-wing government in 1933. There's what's called Austro-Fascism for five years before the Anschluss. And uh, Dolfus, um, the, 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 the leader of the Austrian clerical party, did almost the same thing, welcomed the POWs. So it's interesting that the sort of the fascist groups who wanted a more expanded idea of a, in German you say Kampfgemeinschaft, fighting community, decided they would bring the POWs in. But in the 1920s, um, they did not get this. And in all, they had to fight for war pensions. And they were up against, uh, the, the person I was talking about um, uh, uh, in, was a Swiss doctor. So this is about, but in Germany as well, the doctors were very um, loathe to um, sign off, um, sign, sign sick notes for POWs or say that they, they were entitled to war pensions. Many of these doctors had worked before for workers' accident insurance schemes, uh, uh, you know, protecting them from having to pay out pensions. And there's a big class thing in that as well. Mental health and class is a big thing. If, uh, working class soldiers who are trying to get war pensions would be dismissed in the 20s very easily, I think, in that respect. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a, that's a very helpful answer to that question about the generation of 1914. Um, I'm afraid we've come to the conclusion of our time together. Uh, Dr. Sibby, thank you again for uh, thank you. spending your time with us today and for your research at the National Library of Medicine. Uh, we look forward to welcoming you back and keeping in touch and uh, all the best to you in your future work. And we will keep in touch. I look forward to doing so. Thank yeah, you again. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll enjoy keeping in touch with you in the future. Likewise. I'll make sure that happens. Thank Likewise. you. Pleasure. Thank you so much.